So many people use the Jamie Abersall Play Along books as a resource for learning jazz improvisation, and they are a terrific resource. But I've noticed very recently there's been a lot of questions and confusion about how to properly use the books. So in this series, and this is going to be part one, I'm going to be going over how to use some of the more popular books, showing you basically step by step how to approach using this resource to help boost your improvisation. Hi, I'm Donna from DonnaSchwartzMusic.com, the site to boost your performance, your improvisation, your tone up to the next level. So in this part one of this series on how to use the Jamie Abersall books, I'm going to be going over volume 24. Why 24, you may ask? Because this should be the volume that if you're beginning improvising or you're teaching improvis improvisation to beginners, this is the one you start with. Okay, this is the one that I feel you should start with. And when I interviewed Jamie Abersold for my Everything Saxophone podcast, he felt the same way. So in this video, I'm going to go over the parts of this book, um, how to approach it. And I'm also going to be going over some of the uh, exercises that you should be playing to build your technique and build your ears. All right, so here we are. We're, you know, looking at, this is an online version of volume 24. And Jamie knows, I interviewed him for the Everything Saxophone podcast. He realizes now that not everybody is reading the verbiage, the stuff in the beginning of the book. So what does he start off with? Well, in his brief introduction, people traditionally do not read the instruction or introductions for new items they purchased. <laughs> for this reason, I'm writing this page of suggestions, okay? Now for him, his thing has always been, his mantra has always been, play what you hear in your head. Everybody can improvise, okay? So... That's basically what he's saying here. Here's what I'm going to suggest, actually. I'm going to say um, that I think you should definitely read the brief introduction. If you're not a music teacher, you don't need to read that part. Um, I would also read this official introduction, um, a little bit of it, because it's going to make it make more sense to you. Um, otherwise, you may find yourself getting a little bit lost, to be honest with you. All right, so this book itself has major and minor keys, but the minor is not the natural minor. It's Dorian minor, all right? And if you're not sure what that means, check out my YouTube videos for um, playing with modes, okay, and understanding the modes. Super important. So I would definitely follow his suggestion with beginning with a key and a scale that's easy and comfortable for you. And for most wind players, it's the first track, which is concert B flat major. Um, for guitarists, for I'm going to say for guitarists, you'd probably want to start with an open string. So it could be concert D, it could be concert E, you know, whatever's most comfortable for you. So in this middle part of the book, and it starts like around, um, this is the concert key. So if you're a flute player, uh, guitar, piano, bass guitar, actually bass guitar, there's a bass clef section, but concert pitch instruments would start here. There are sections for B-flat instruments, E-flat instruments, and there should be bass clef as well. So if you just want to play, then you're going to be going to the middle of this book. But I've got to explain this to you because too many people get confused. So this first track is not three measures long. Okay, and you don't, this is not the first measure. What this is over here, this first measure is showing you the scale that you can play that will sound fine with this track. All right, so let me say that again. This is not its own measure in the play along. These two are the measures that get repeated ad nauseum over and over and over again. What this is, is a reference. It's a reference point. It's the scale that you can play that will sound good over these two chords, okay? 
Now, let me address something also that people get confused about. The notes that are darkened in are the notes that are going to fit the chords. So going here, the notes that are darkened in are the 1, 3, 5, the 7, and the 9. Okay, those notes will sound fine. But some of you are thinking, but that just says B flat chord. It doesn't say B flat nine or B flat major seven or whatever, um, or B flat major nine. No, it doesn't. However, a little pro tip for you, a little advanced tip. If you've got a major seven chord or, you know, a chord just written with the, with the uh, letter names, the seventh, the major seventh and the ninth will sound fine most of the time, most of the time. Okay. So those are the notes that you'd want to emphasize in that measure. In the second measure, this confuses people. Not guitarists, though, not bassists, and not some piano players. But wind players get confused by this. We don't understand this. What this means is a concert C minor chord, C, E flat, G, and in the bass, that's the slash, and the bass is an F. Now, some of you are thinking, that doesn't make sense. What kind of chord is that? Well, technically, it's a minor two chord with the five in the bass, okay, the fifth degree of the scale in the bass. Really what this is, it's a five, seven, okay, dominant seven, sus. All right, so what does that mean? Well, in the key of concert B flat, a five, seven chord is F7. But F7 is F, A, C, E flat. But he doesn't want the A in there. So he calls it a 5-7 sus. And you'll see this in the instructions in the beginning of the book. And what this chord really is, is F in the bass, and then you have C, E flat, and G. And honestly, B flat should be in there because it's a sus chord. Okay? So this chord is acting like, although in my, in my opinion, it's not a strong enough dominant seven chord it's acting like a strong it's acting like a five seven chord but for me it's not strong enough because you do need that a you do need that third in order to be able to really hear it as a dominant seventh but anyway i digress let me go back so when you're playing along with this track and these this is for those folks that just want to hit the middle of the book and just start playing one of the things jamie says to do just put the track on and just play just play what you hear in your head. And that's fine. You could absolutely do that. But then you're going to come to a point where you're going to be like, okay, I'm not really hearing, you know, I'm not able to play some of the advanced things I'm hearing in my head, or I'm just not hearing cool enough stuff. Here's where you have to treat these tracks, your approach to them, like an exercise, like a technical exercise. So what I would recommend, the first thing that I tell my students Make sure you're hearing the chords change. All right, that's the first step. Definitely make sure you're hearing the chords change. Second step, get very familiar with these darkened in notes. And if it's too much for you to deal with the seventh, the major seventh here in the nine, or the dominant seven and the nine or whatever, don't deal with them for right now. Deal with the triad, the one, the three, and the five of each chord. And first play them without any backing track, get it in your fingers and then start to play them with the track. I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about in a minute. The next step would be after you play the triad, then you would add the seventh. When you're comfortable with the seventh, add the ninth. Okay, you get the idea. And then after you play that up and down as a technical exercise, then you could play what you hear in your head and just use those notes. And then the next step would be maybe playing the first three notes of every chord. Um, I should say every scale here. So here you're going to be playing a non-darkened in note. You're going to be playing the ninth here, just down the octave. You're going to be playing the ninth here, just down the octave. And maybe play those three notes back and forth over and over again, and then make up, you know, improvise, make up your own stuff. Then do the first five notes, same idea. And then maybe do the whole scale, including the ninth, okay? Approach this also as a technique or technical exercise as well. So this way you have more fluency on your instrument and you're building up your technique. Now some other things that you can do are suggested by Jamie here, and this is page, uh, probably around page 24 or something. 
these are typical major scale licks and he has them for you know all the instruments this just happens to be concert pitch and he's got examples here and these examples will work with track one okay there's two pages of example they work for the first track track one concert b flat if you like these licks you would need to transpose them for the other tracks okay and and they sound very good against the uh, backing tracks and you'll notice as i'm scrolling through you've got some chromatic notes here too you don't necessarily just have scale notes so this is a little bit more advanced for some people but it's going to open up your ears and give you more possibilities of things to play now this part over here this is a little tricky because it's a pdf and in the book um this is the one thing that some people complain about uh this particular page where um you're dealing with major minor and dominant seventh scales this is technical these are technical exercises to practice on every single scale that you know um playing the whole scale um let's see actually these are the scales excuse me and he has the major scales he's got the dominant seventh scales those are the mixolydians he's got the dorian minor scales that will help you with your fluency again this is technical practice you don't want to avoid this stuff, but I just want to help you to understand this particular part. Now, page 18 are some technical exercises. He calls them preparatory exercises. And uh, this is what I was referring to before, actually, where he gives you ideas about how to work on your major scales or your dominant seven, that's a mixolydian mode, or your minor, Dorian scales. A few exercises there. And yes, in the book, you have to turn the book you know, so that it's like in landscape mode, so to speak, in order to see that. See that. If you get this as a PDF, you'll have to print out the page in order to uh, understand this. He also talks about the chromatic scale, and I think it's really important. Once you're understanding, you know, I'm going to say like one, maybe one to three scales, you should start learning your chromatic scale. It's like vocabulary, all right? You need to know what your fingerings are. The second CD, the middle of the book, um, is minors and again it's Dorian minor so it's not going to be the um, it's not going to be the key signature that you're expecting if you understand some theory and you understand you know your your natural minor melodic and harmonic all right these are Dorian minors and these tracks are a little bit different in the sense that some of them he just has the scale written out with the the note uh, the notes from the chords darkened in as reference points and over here in this section um, there are some keys where it's not just the reference scale, but he's treating this like a two, minor two, Dorian two, to a five seven. All right, because the key of this line, for example, this says A flat minor, it's concert pitch. The key for this is really, honestly, not um, A flat minor. It, it uses an A flat Dorian scale. It's really the key of G flat because this is the two, so the two of G flat is A flat, the five of G flat is D flat. All right, so treat this as a two, minor two to a five seven. That's why you see this here. Some of you may be confused by that, so I just wanted to point that out. All right, so for this part, I'm going to demonstrate some of the exercises that you can do as part of your technical practicing of improvisation. And I'm gonna be using track one, concert B flat. I'm going to be first playing the, uh, the triad, the one, three, five of each chord. And then I'm going to be doing the seventh, so the one three five seven, then the one three five seven nine, and then I'll do the first three notes of the scales, and then the first five notes of the scales. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Thank you. 
endless possibilities. And if you approach, a lot of people tend to, with improvisation, they just think, okay, let me open up the book and I'm gonna improvise right away. That's what I'm gonna do. But there's preparatory work that needs to be done. You've gotta understand the notes that will sound good against the chords versus the notes that will clash really badly and the notes that will clash a little bit and will add a little bit of tension. So that's the way you want to use these books, the Abersol books. You want to use them as play along as guides, but you also have to realize that you're going to have to do some practicing and you could make it fun. Actually using a play along makes practicing fun. And having a chord background is going to give you a basis and understanding of what you're playing and how it relates to chords. So I would use these books starting with volume, volume 24, excuse me, volume 24, and I would use it as a way to build technique and also build understanding of what the chords sound like, what the note choices sound like against the chords. And once you're done with the major section, and again, it could include playing those major licks that he has, those two pages of major licks in the concert B-flat key. Um, once you're done with the major section, all the keys, then approach the minor section. And again, the minors are Dorian minors, and some of the tracks are treated as the two, five, seven progression. Just keep that in mind. So once again, hopefully this video helped you in approaching uh, Jamie Rasol's volume 24. In the next video, I'm gonna be detailing how to approach volume one, which most people start off with when it comes to improvisation, but actually that should be the second volume in the series of Aversol books as reference points. So thanks so much for joining me in this video. I hope to see you in the next one. And don't forget, hit that subscribe bell or button. I'd really appreciate it. And you know what? I do have a comment for your question. What are your questions when it comes to playing along with the Jamie Abersall books? Let me know in the comments below. All right, I'll check out, definitely I'll check out each comment. Thanks so much for joining me. On that note, take care. Have a great day.